Our walk starts at St Nicholas Minster and wends its way through the churchyard taking in a number of ground features that can still be seen. We wander to the other side of the wall and examine the tower that stands in one corner before crossing an area where a magnificent gate once stood. Then following the town wall past what is now Sainsbury's car park, we cross the road to the site of St Mary's Hospital before walking towards the site of the market gate. As we continue south, there's an opportunity to examine the history of some of the other towers along the wall before turning towards St George's Theatre and finding out what stood there in medieval times. Crossing over to Christchurch, we walk north along King Street and stop at Hidden Gem before entering row 89 and making our way to the site of the Grave Friars Friary. Then south to the Toll House. Finally, we find out about the rows and conditions of those that lived there. This walk looks at some of the listed monuments in Great Yarmouth. Our emphasis today is on the medieval age. Although we will pass a number of buildings, you will no doubt admire from a later period. We hope to give you a sense of how the town developed in medieval times. Like many towns, it was dominated by its religious houses, commerce and the beginnings of civil administration. But unlike other towns, it was not dominated by a lord of the manor, having grown up as a temporary settlement on the sandbank where itinerant fishermen would trade herring during the season. Hence its entry in the Doomsday Book, mentioning 70 burgesses and 24 fishermen from Galston. It was a place of trade, having no agricultural benefit, and as such the area was the property of the king who was only interested in ensuring tax was gathered on the commerce that took place. By 1208 the town had grown in size and King John granted it a charter for a regular fee of £55. The town became a free borough, giving the townspeople self-government and the right to hold courts and set up merchant guilds. Our first building is St Nicholas Church, founded in 1101 by Herbert de Lozenger, the first Bishop of Norwich, and consecrated in 1119. The building is very possibly the town's oldest and was originally a Benedictine priory church. The nave, with columns alternately octagonal and circular, was rebuilt in the reign of King John. A portion of the chancel is of the same date. About 50 years later, the aisles were widened, so that the nave is now, rather unusually, the narrowest part of the building. At the west end of St Nicholas, you will see that the footprint of the church extends for no particular reason. However, it demonstrates that there was once a structure here that is now lost. In 1330, a new aisle began construction, paid for by the young men of the town. Hence its name, the Bachelor Isle. It was 32.5 metres from north to south and 14.3 metres from east to west. Considerable progress had been made, the walls being 18 metres from the ground, when the work was suddenly stopped by an outbreak of the plague. They were never resumed and allowed to fall into ruin. The walls remained until 1650 when some of the great stones were taken down and carried to the haven's mouth, where they were employed in repair of the piers. Let's move from the west end of the church to the south side, where you can see the old Benedictine priory. It was small in comparison with some, and virtually nothing remains of their church. However, what is believed to be the rectory still exists today. Now the Priory Community Centre run by a charity. Since the Reformation it has had many uses. From 1852 to 1998 it was a school. Heading east we can follow the path through the churchyard. To the north is the churchyard wall but 
As this 19th century map shows, it is part of a medieval wall that enclosed the town. In 1261, King Henry III gave the townspeople the right to enclose the town with a wall and ditch. Today it is the longest medieval town wall in England, surpassed only by the city of York. Eleven of the 15 to 16 towers still remain. Building did not begin until 1285, as money had to be raised. It was paid for by Muirage, a toll on all ships entering and leaving the harbour. The residents were required to give their own labour, but many provided legacies or paid others to make the, a physical contribution. Here we see the first structure built, King Henry's Tower, is the only non-round tower which required dressed stone at each corner. This probably proved too expensive, therefore cheaper options were sought for the rest of the towers. Moving to the other side of the tower, we can see the difference in the height of the ground, something we will find out about later in our walk. The wall heading westwards was the last to be built. Notice the dog leg right angle. The original wall continued straight to the river, but building stopped once the plague arrived, meaning the wall would take some 100 years to complete. For some reason it was decided to take down the original section of wall and build further out, creating this dog leg. Maybe the ground has pr had proved unstable. One writer has suggested the additional area was used to bury the dead from the plague. Certainly nothing was built in this area for centuries, and Swindon, the Yarmouth historian, states that the new North Gate was erected at the expense of persons employed in interring during the plague. By the time this section was completed, as a defensive structure it was obsolete, as cannon had already been used for over 60 years in European wars, and the walls would not have stood up to the pounding. Returning to the churchyard, you can see a mound that follows the line of the wall across the churchyard. In this cleared section of the churchyard stood a town gate. It was blocked up during the Reformation and part demolished in 1642, finally being cleared in 1800. Picking up the wall on the other side, it runs along the edge of Sainsbury's car park, supposedly the site of the pits used for burial of plague victims from 1579. Not, of course, to be confused with the 1348 plague, where Yarmouth lost up to half its population. Moving swiftly on, we cross the road and reach the site of the Pudding Gate. At this entrance to the marketplace stood the Pudding Gate, which was demolished in 1837 to widen the roadway. Pudding is an old English term for animal entrails. On this east side of the market, there was butchery taking place in medieval times, and the gate was the nearest when it came to disposal of the entrails into the moat, which lay to the north. The moat was an additional trench dug to protect the northeast corner of the town in 1642. Connected with the river, it naturally filled with brackish water and was filled in in the 19th century. Looking across the entrance to Fisher's Court can be seen the Hospital Tower, named after St Mary's Hospital, built around 1278, which stood where the present school stands. Medieval hospitals were religious establishments and when founded housed a master, two priests, eight brethren and eight sisters. At dissolution in 1551, its lodgings and large chapel were used as a grammar school. By 1750, it was being used as a workhouse and by 1772, it was recorded as a bridewell or prison and children's hospital. The school was rebuilt in the 1840s. If you were to go to the front of the school building, the façade is a, is a rebuild of about 1900. Let's continue along the road and turn up past the British Heart Foundation and opposite the feathers. Here we see the site of the old market gate. 
For the first time we can see the internal structure of the wall with its arrow slits and archer recesses. These would have given protection while enabling archers to fire along the, a wide sweep of the wall. Above the archers can be seen remains of the parapet that ran along the wall. If the gate is open it's worth keeping to the east side of the wall where you can get access to the lower part of the guard tower. The name derives from a large enclosed yard called the main guard that lay inside the wall. This may have been the organisational centre for times when there was fear from attack. For example, supposedly it was the rallying point for Nelson's sailors before the Battle of Copenhagen. Here we can see some examples of a number of holes, some lined with tile or brick in other sections. These can be found along the whole length of the wall and may be put log holes used to hold wooden scaffolding poles during construction. We can also see another architectural feature known as a squinch which can be found along the wall between the towers and the actual wall. This was an arch built over a corner to support the joint between the adjoining walls meeting at an angle to one another. Leaving the Market Gate shopping centre behind, we walk the short distance to Regent Road and cross into Alexandra Road. Halfway along, we see an example of later adaptations, for example the large window, when the towers along the wall were used for other purposes. Known as the Pinnacle Tower, Palmer says it was a stable in his time. The conical roof was added as early as 1542, and the weather vane bears the date 1680. Palmer speculates it was placed there by the corporation, as the initial letters of the bailiff and chamberlains are displayed as part of the ironwork design. Palmer also states it was used in the 17th century as a lock-up for nocturnal offenders. Let's now walk to the end of Alexandra Road and cross the road to the area outside St George's Theatre. Near the site of Christchurch is another of Yarmouth's lost buildings, the Kingst House or Castle. There is little recorded about it, though it is thought to have been built before 1208. Description suggests its style was Norman, with four corner towers and a central keep, resembling the architecture of Rochester Castle. Before the wall was built, it acted as Yarmouth's lookout and stronghold, a safe house for the town's dignitaries in times of danger. Following the construction of the wall, it was too expensive to maintain and superfluous for defence. It fell into disrepair and was eventually used to form the foundations of a mound which was built in 1569. Now we cross over to Christchurch and walks north along King Street as far as number 160. This 500 year old grade 2 listed building which has been neglected since 2001 has been compulsory purchased by the council in order to get the repairs needed. It is the last jettied timber-framed building in the urban area of Great Yarmouth. Now work has begun by the Great Yarmouth Preservation Trust and will take about two years and cost between four hundred and five hundred thousand pounds. Looking down the row on either side one can see the timber frame and jettying clearly. At the moment it has been dated between 1520 and 1620 but a more exact date will be obtained when the timbers are dated. Now go down row 89 and across the King Street car park into Howard Street South and then into Greyfriars Way. Cross Greyfriars Way and you'll come across Greyfriars itself. A great deal of Yarmouth in medieval times was owned and occupied by religious houses. This was the site of the Franciscan Friary, known as the Grey Friars. To the south were the Dominicans or Black Friars, and to the north the Carmelites or White Friars, the bottom of Broad Row, 
and at St. Nicholas Minster was the Benedictine Priory. The Franciscans first arrived in England in 1224. They divided into two groups, those that adhered strictly to a hermetic and life of poverty known as observance, and those that ministered to the growing populations in cities and towns known as conventuals. The Yarmouth Friary was of this latter type and was probably formed in 1226. The friar survived through the generosity of those whom they ministered to, for they had no financial reserves of their own. Will show that townsfolk make frequent small bequests to the Grey Friars, often accompanied by a request for internment in the church or churchyard. Many of the once powerful family of Falstaff were buried here. Return to Greyfriars Way and head south, crossing Yarmouth Way and into Tollhouse Street. The Toll House is the oldest civic building in Great Yarmouth and in Britain. Built in the mid-13th century, its original purpose is obscure, but it's likely to have been a merchant's house and would have testified to the wealth of the person that lived here. The house passed into the hands of the Yarmouth town officials, where, in the Hining Chamber, herring taxation levies were set. It was also where different types of courts were held, and the town jail was situated with the notorious dungeon known as the Hold. It was here that the trial of the Yarmouth witches took place, following the employment of Matthew Hopkins, the self-styled witchfinder general by the Town Council in 1645 to, quote, make search for such wicked persons if there be here. Five were hanged. Here also, in the early 1800s, Sarah Martin read the Bible and taught prisoners to read and write, and women to sew garments to provide skills and employment when they left the prison. Continue along Tollhouse Street and down Sackville Close and walk through to the area outside the historic England row houses. The old town was made up of narrow streets known as the rows, running east to west. Numbered 1 to 145 in 1804, there were some half rows and two that were never given numbers, Broad and Market Row. First mentioned in sources in 1198, before the building of the town wall in 1285. In the 13th century, it had formed a unique town plan. A number of these roads had strange names, such as Body Snatchers Row, Row 6, where it was mistakenly believed that Thomas Vaughan, who stole bodies from the churchyard, operated in 1827-8 although in reality it was row three where he hired a house. And Kitty Witch's row, whose name is obscure, but nothing to do with witches. Most are named after people or businesses in or at the end of the row. For example, row 46, known as Sewell's row, named after Anna Sewell's parents, the author of Black Beauty, who ran a grocery business there. Conditions in the rows varied, with the poorest areas being in the north of the town. However, here, where more prosperous townspeople lived, the buildings were large and had courtyards and gardens. Beginning in the late 18th century, the wealthier classes moved out, taking up new residences outside the town wall or in South Town or the villages beyond. The former houses became tenements with multiple occupancy and their courtyards were built over to increase population density. Many row houses were damaged by Second World War bombing or demolished during post-war clearances. These two surviving properties have been preserved to show the different characteristics of the dwellings over various stages in history. And so ends our virtual heritage walk. The Great Yarmouth Heritage Guides will be pleased to see you on one of our walks in the near future.